morning again to all of you and I just want to extend a special thank you to all of our deacons and our live stream ministry who do so much week in and week out behind the scenes to make this space so sacred and safe for us to worship each week. Thank you for all that you do for the glory of God. Would you please pray with me? O oh God of all people, we thank you for the gift of coming together as one people to reflect on your word. And O oh dear God, may the words that I have to offer here this morning please you and honor you and glorify your holy, holy name. In Jesus' sweet name we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning, I want to begin by acknowledging that this has been an especially difficult and troubling and painful week for all of us and for our global community as we all try to process our feelings and respond to the news of the horrific events currently taking place in the Middle East. And, and in upsetting and confusing and overwhelming and troubling times like these, it is important to remember that all of us are called to turn toward one another for conversation and companionship and support as we seek to figure out together how to respond to the suffering of the people of Palestine and Israel today. As I was preparing for this sermon and wrestling with this familiar Old Testament passage from Exodus chapter 32, while also trying to make sense of the tumultuous news of the world this week, I remembered some words of wisdom of one of my homiletics professor in seminary, Dr. Langnecht, who would remind us that the trouble in the text that we read reminds us of the trouble in the world today. And yet, and yet the hope in the text also inspires us to look for the hope in the world today. I believe I may have shared these words with you before, but I find these words of wisdom to be encouraging in times like these. And certainly during this past week, as we've all been reacting to the events and the images on our screens, the trouble in the text speaks to the trouble in the world today, just as the hope in the text speaks and points us to the hope in the world today. So then, with that in mind, let us now turn to our text for today from the Old Testament, from the book of Exodus. Now, this is a familiar passage, and it is often referred to as the story of the golden calf. However, this scene that we encounter here in chapter 32 that Amy read is really the continuation of a story that began eight chapters earlier back in Exodus chapter 24 when Moses left the people and he headed up the mountain in order to receive the Ten Commandments. Now, as Moses was leaving to go up the mountain, he tells the elders to wait for him 
And he also instructs them that if there were to be a dispute among the people, then they were to consult with Aaron and her. This is back in Exodus chapter 24. And so, for the next 40 days and 40 nights, Moses was away from the people, while God and he were deep into the details about all kinds of plans and concerns regarding the construction of the tabernacle and the requirements for ordination in the priesthood and so on and so forth. But now here in chapter 32, what we discover is that this prolonged absence of their faithful and trusted and beloved Mo leader, Moses, the people were now becoming anxious, and they were worrying about their future, and they were losing faith, and they started to act out. And do you remember what they said to their then interim leader, Aaron, at that point? They said, as for this Moses, that man who brought us out of Egypt, well, we just don't know what has become of him. Now, first of all, it is significant that in this text, the people give credit to Moses and not God for their liberation. And so in this scene, without that grounding in the promises and presence of God, we discover that the people of God have now lost their faith. And they are now pressuring Aaron and demanding and insisting and saying to him, Come, make gods for us who shall go before us. And what does Aaron do? Well, under Aaron's leadership, during this transitional time within their life together, while Moses is absent, it gets worse. Rather than remaining steadfast in his faith, Aaron gives in to the pressure and the demands of the people. And in fact, he ordered them to collect all the gold in their possession so that they could use it to create a golden calf to worship. What was Aaron thinking? Was this just a temporary lapse of judgment? A momentary loss of faith? Was Aaron a people pleaser? Was he reacting rather than responding to the heightened anxiety levels of the people that had apparently skyrocketed during Moses' absence. Clearly, Aaron compromised his own theology and beliefs so as not to upset the people. Now, as if this story from Exodus so far is not discomforting enough, it then takes another surprise turn. When we read of God's impassioned response and anger toward the people in response to their idolatry and faithlessness and that all-out bad behavior. And then how does Moses respond to God's reaction? Well, while acknowledging God's strong feelings, Moses is also able to engage God in dialogue, even in this moment of God's anger, while also offering a broader and historical perspective by recalling the promises that God had made to Abraham and Isaac and Israel. In 
this holy moment, in this dialogue, this back and forth between Moses and God, Moses is earnest and thoughtful and responsive. And it turns out that he is able to de-escalate the crisis at hand. And how does God respond to Moses? Well, in verse 14, we read, And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he had planned to bring on his people. God was able to truly hear Moses, and it turned out that God changed God's own mind. Even though this is a familiar text to me, and even though I've preached on it before, it hadn't ever occurred to me until very recently that this conversation between God and Moses offers us an example of a dialogue. Several years ago, early on in my training to become a spiritual director here at the Spirituality Network at church, I remember learning the difference between the terms discussion and dialogue. One of the books that we read that first semester was called Practicing the Sacred Art of Listening. It was written by Kay Lindahl, who is also the founder of an organization called the Listening Center. And Lindahl explains that the word discussion comes from the Latin roots dis, meaning a part, and quater, meaning to shake. So in other words, a discussion is an analysis or a search for an answer. It is done in the spirit of looking for results. On the other hand, the term dialogue comes from the Greek words dia, meaning through, and logos, which is translated as meaning or word. So the term dialogue is a flow of meaning through words in which new understandings emerge that might not have been present before. Dialogues take place in the spirit of inquiry or wanting to know and understand. And so I wonder, I wonder where in your life is there room for more dialogue, that desire to seek understanding and to be understood. How do you practice dialogue with family members and friends and coworkers or within your neighborhood? and within our life together as First Church. Where is dialogue most needed currently within our wider community and across our state and throughout our nation? And how? Oh God, how can we encourage dialogue and diplomacy within our global community, even in the midst of our warring ways. I'd like to close this morning with some words of wisdom from Malala Yousafzai, who you may remember is the Pakistani activist for female education and the world's youngest Nobel Peace Prize laureate. You might recall she won that award back in 2014 when she was only 17 years old. Malala Yousafzai said, 
the best way to solve problems and to fight against war is through dialogue. Thanks be to God. Amen.